What if I told you that the climate crisis isn't just a problem for the future? What if I told you that the climate crisis is actually a now problem and it's to do with human lives? A few years ago, I was working as a doctor in the emergency department and it's an interesting job because you never know what's going to come through that front door. One minute you've got major trauma, heart attacks and strokes and the next you've got kids with Lego stuck up their nose and adults with things stuck in other places. <laughs> Like I said, it's an interesting job, but after 10 years of countless exams, nights and weekends, I felt like I was stuck on this never-ending treadmill and I was starting to need a bit of a change. So I did some extensive Googling and I came across a conference on something called expedition medicine. Now, I didn't really know what expedition medicine was, so when I heard all these doctors, nurses and paramedics telling stories of traveling the world, doing all these things I didn't even know were possible with a career in medicine, my mind was blown. And so I came home with a new ambition. I wanted to become an expedition doctor. Now, there was only one small problem, and that was that the longest hike I'd ever been on was about two, maybe three hours long, and my only experience of sleeping in a tent was in the living room as a toddler. <laughs> but I trained hard, and eventually I landed my first job supporting a group of students climbing Mount Kilimanjaro to raise money for charity. So a few weeks later, I was off, and I had to spend a lot of nights in a tent, which definitely took some getting used to. But I had the trip of a lifetime, and I came home totally sold on a career in expedition medicine. And before long, I was going from expedition to expedition, traveling the whole world, from the Sahara Desert to Everest Base Camp, from the jungles of Cambodia to the volcanoes of Ecuador. It was absolutely incredible. And the medicine was fantastic, too. I was doing everything from evacuating life-threatening altitude sickness by helicopter to treating the most violently explosive gastroenteritis you will ever see, <laughs> to simply getting up close and personal with literally hundreds of sweaty blisters. But then in 2019, I went on a trip that changed everything. Two months in the Himalayas, a month in Pakistan and a month in India, and for those two months I had no phone signal at all. No phone calls, no emails, no to-do list. In fact, we were so remote that in the north of Pakistan, we were accompanied not just by the team of local staff, but also a small flock of chickens and a goat. Now, the goat quickly became our friend, and we called him Bob. And each day, we would climb higher and higher, and the number of chickens would sadly fall lower and lower. And each day, Bob would keep us company, and if there were any leftovers at dinner time, we'd feed them to Bob, so Bob was happy too. But then came the fateful day when goat was on the menu for dinner. So Bob was led off to one side, and Bob came back again as curry. No. At the end of the meal, there was actually a plate of liver left over, and one of the climbers said, don't worry about it, we'll just feed it to the goat. You can just imagine her face when she realized that that was indeed the goat. And in that moment, it struck me just how disconnected we are from the food we eat back at home. It's just out of sight and out of mind. And it made me stop and ask myself, how could I justify eating all this meat and dairy if I don't even stop for a moment to think about the pain and the life of suffering that I was putting all these hundreds, if not thousands, of animals through? You know, I'd always told myself I loved animals. I can't even tell you how many funny cat videos I've seen on YouTube. And yet there I was, doing the complete opposite. I mean, isn't it mind-blowing to think that by the time I finish giving you this talk, almost 200,000 animals will have been slaughtered for food in the UK alone? Fast forward a few weeks to the north of India, in a place called Ladakh. In the few days before we set off into the mountains, I met a woman there called Deskit. Now, Deskit is an environmental lawyer who'd been working in the region for some time. She was telling us how the village communities that live in the mountain there rely on the glaciers that melt in the springtime, providing fresh water to the valley for them to drink and to grow food. But recently, due to climate change, the glaciers were melting earlier and earlier, leaving them in a drought for most of summer. They no longer had enough water to drink, and they could no longer grow food. 
Mothers and fathers were struggling to feed their children, and many were being forced to move to the city to work in dangerous things like road construction. Entire villages were being plunged into poverty. Many had been left abandoned, and I began to feel an overwhelming sense of guilt and responsibility. These people had lived peacefully in the mountains for generations, but now, because of climate change, because of our lifestyles back at home, not theirs, these people were suffering. And it made me ask the question, how many other people around the world were being affected in a similar way by the climate crisis? A few hundred, a few thousand, perhaps? EU data shows that every single year since 2008, 26 million people have lost their homes due to extreme weather events. 26 million human lives affected every single year. And so I came home from this expedition with mixed emotions. But before I had time to process any of this, we heard news of thousands of lives being lost across China, France, Italy, and Spain. And before we knew it, COVID-19 struck the UK. At this point, I just started working as a doctor in intensive care. And within a matter of days, we were totally overwhelmed, and I was angry. I was angry at how little we had done to prepare and the lack of PPE. I was frustrated by the mountains of plastic waste we were generating in the hospital. But most of all, I was upset at how many people were suffering needlessly, despite having done nothing to deserve it. COVID-19 ripped apart life as we knew it, and it tore apart families. And I know because it was my job to certify their deaths. It was my job to call up their loved ones and tell them that their mother, their father, their husband, their wife, or even their child had died. That was my job for months, and it was heartbreaking. And during this time, something dawned on me, that all of this anguish due to COVID was so visible, but elsewhere around the world, people had been suffering for years due to the climate crisis. It was just far less visible, out of sight, out of mind. And I realized that I'd been telling myself for years that I cared about climate change, but the fact that I hadn't actually done anything to change my behaviors meant that not only was I a part of the problem, I was actively contributing to the suffering of millions of people around the world. And I realized that as a healthcare professional, to live up to my moral and professional duty to look after the public and to care for people, addressing the climate crisis was no longer something I could ignore. It was the one thing that mattered the most. Now, many of you will know the environmental consequences of the climate crisis. But how many of you have stopped to actually think about the human consequences? In 2019, the World Health Organization stated that climate change is the single biggest health threat facing humanity. So why is that? Well, firstly, humans are not designed to cope with such high temperatures. As temperatures rise, we struggle to lose heat. We suffer from dehydration, exhaustion, and fatigue. Our kidneys might get damaged, and we might even experience a life-threatening heat stroke. But the heat is just one small aspect. Because as sea levels rise, and we continue to increase the energy of the atmosphere, we start to see increasing numbers of extreme weather events. Hurricanes, floods, heat waves, and droughts. All of these have the potential to cause immediate and direct threat to human lives. <coughs> Falling trees, flying debris, risk of fires and drowning, rapidly followed by lack of shelter, lack of access to safe water and to food and increased risk of diseases like cholera and malaria. But even if you survive one of these extreme weather events, what happens if a month later there's another flood? What happens if the drought goes on so long that the rain never comes and the food never grows? What happens then? Eventually, you're forced to leave your home, just like the village communities in Ladakh. Just like the 26 million people who go through this year after year, and just like the 1 billion people who are predicted to lose their homes due to the climate crisis in the next 30 years. 1 billion people. That's an eighth of the entire world's population on the move. And now the climate crisis really does become a health crisis. Mass migration and widespread crop failure leads to global food insecurity. Food prices rise, cost of living goes up, and we fall into a global recession. The most vulnerable are hit the hardest. 
Health inequalities get worse rather than better, and mental health declines. Soon, hospitals are struggling to cope with the increased demand. Health workers are suffering from burnout, and entire health systems start to collapse. Meanwhile, other issues are continuing to escalate. Water shortages, logistical issues, increased global risk of pandemics, and even conflict. And if you think we're safe here in the UK, then think again. Because this year alone, wildfires erupted across the UK. 15 fire and rescue services had to declare a major incident. And London's fire brigade had its busiest day on record since World War II. Not only that, one of the country's best hospitals had to declare a major incident when its entire computer system failed during the heat wave. And then there's air pollution. Almost 10 years ago now, a nine-year-old girl from South London called Ella was battling severe asthma. The air pollution in London was causing her airways to close up, and time and time again she ended up in the emergency department. But despite her mother's pleas for help, there was nothing the doctors could do to save her. Ella became the first person in the UK to have air pollution put down as the cause of death on her death certificate. She was only nine years old. Since then, high air pollution days in UK cities have accounted for thousands more children being hospitalized because of asthma. So how many more children do we need to lose before we start paying attention? In healthcare, we're often so busy fighting fires that it's easy to forget the holy grail of medicine. That prevention is so much better than cure. The reality is, often there is no cure. Over the next 20 years, the climate crisis is predicted to cause millions upon millions of additional deaths. And so addressing the climate crisis now really is the best possible example of preventative medicine. But we are running out of time. We have a unique opportunity to act now. We have a rapidly closing window of opportunity to make changes that will save millions of lives, to make changes that will allow humans not only to survive, but to thrive in a world where humans coexist with nature, where rainforests grow wild, where birds sing and coral reefs blossom. I believe we can create a world like nothing we've ever seen before. We no longer need to burn fossil fuels that poison children's lungs. We no longer need to rely on killing animals for nutrition. A clean, ethical, and sustainable future is possible. But to have any ch chance of making this happen, we all need to play our part. And so today, I ask you to consider these three things. First, we need to take an active interest and to educate ourselves. For example, from the wider impacts of the climate crisis to the individual impacts of our own behaviors. For example, many of us avoid a plastic bag, which is fantastic. But did you know that a plastic bag contains the equivalent of about three grams of carbon? A paper towel, 10 grams of carbon. An eight ounce steak, 20,000 grams of carbon. It's about 6,500 plastic bags. The second, we need to make changes in our daily lives. We say we care about climate change. Now, we need to make sure our behaviors match our values. We need to walk and to cycle more. We need to switch to ethical banks and renewable energy providers. But most importantly, we all need to stop eating so much meat and dairy. And it's not just animal rights activists that are saying this. Leading academics and institutions from around the world have stated that switching to a predominantly plant-based diet is the single most important thing any individual can do to reduce their impact on the environment. So tomorrow, when you're buying lunch, about to pay at the self-checkout. Just stop, pause, and think. Where does this food really come from? What are the plant-based alternatives? Does my coffee really need that splash of milk? Finally, we need to stop delaying. Now is the time for each and every one of us to take action, whether that's in our personal lives, at work, or in the community. And it doesn't matter if we can't do it perfectly, because the climate crisis won't be fixed by a bunch of people doing things perfectly. But it will be fixed when millions of people, all of us, come together and start moving in the right direction. Yes, governments and corporations bear the burden of responsibility to change. But today, we don't just vote at the polling stations. 
Today we vote with our voices and we vote with our money. The products we buy, the food we eat, the conversations we have, these are the things that influence the economics of the world we live in. And these are the things that influence the choices of politicians and corporations. And when we come together, speak as one and act as one, we start to become a force they can no longer ignore. That is when change happens, and that is what will fix the climate crisis. Thank you.